Gastrointestinal Bleeding by Dr. Michael Manfredi. My name is Michael Manfredi, and I will be presenting the topic gastrointestinal bleeding. The objectives of this video are to identify the classifications of gastrointestinal bleeding, describe how to perform a physical exam on a patient with gastrointestinal bleeding, and identify labs and studies that may be helpful in diagnosing a patient with gastrointestinal bleeding. Gastrointestinal bleeding is classified based on its origin. Upper gastrointestinal bleeding is defined as bleeding that occurs proximal to the ligament of trites. Lower gastrointestinal bleeding occurs distal to the ligament of trites. The incidence of GI bleeding in children is not well established in the general population. In upper GI bleeding, most studies have been done in the pediatric critical care setting. Reports range from 6.4% to 25% of all ICU admissions. For lower GI bleeding, a study looking at pediatric tertiary care admissions to the emergency department showed that lower GI bleeding occurred in 0.3% of all admissions. Of those 0.3% admissions, four patients had severe life-threatening GI bleeding. When initially evaluating a patient with GI bleeding, you should focus on the assessment of vital signs, and begin stabilization if necessary. History of present illness, doing a focused medical history, physical examination, lab and diagnostic testing. The general goals to an evaluation of a patient with gastrointestinal bleeding involves assessing hemodynamic status, determine if the patient is actively bleeding, determine the location of bleeding, as well as possible etiology. You receive a page from a nurse that your patient in room 907 just had a large bloody stool. What questions should you ask on the phone? Your first goal is to assess hemodynamic stability of your patient. While you're walking to the room, you can ask the nurse, is the patient on the monitors? If not, can you please place her on monitors? If so, is the patient tachycardic? Also ask the nurse to save the stool if possible, for your review. Hemodynamic stability should be assessed immediately. Tachycardia may be an early sign of intravascular volume depletion. Remember, hypotension is a late sign and may not be present even with significant blood loss. In the setting of normal blood pressure, if possible, obtain orthostatic blood pressure. Once you arrive in your patient's room, what should you focus upon during your initial targeted physical exam? Capillary refill is a quick way to assess intravascular volume. A delayed capillary refill suggests intravascular volume depletion. Oxygen saturation may be decreased due to decreased oxygen carrying capacity. It is important to evaluate for signs of shock. This includes vitals as discussed previously, cool, clammy extremities, and poor mentation. If your patient is hemodynamically unstable or showing signs of shock, this is a red flag, and you should call for backup, including your fellow, attending, or the ICU. However, if your patient is hemodynamically stable without signs of shock, you should make them MPO, ensure that they have IV access, and proceed with further history and examination. The history of present illness for a patient with lower GI bleed first involves determining if there is actually blood or is there another cause of bright red or black stools. You should always perform a stool hemocult test or stool guaiac test. Evaluate the color of the blood. Bright red in the case of cited bleeding is probably in the left colon. Dark red stool in the case of the bleeding is from the right colon. If melana or maroon colored stool, then bleeding is proximal to the ileocecal valve. You should also look at the consistency of the stool. Diarrhea is more likely consistent with colitis. Hard stool is more likely consistent with fissures and constipation. You should always assess the duration of symptoms to see if it is an acute or chronic problem. Remember, a very brisk upper GI bleed can present with bright red blood in the stool. While not pertinent to this case, there are parallel questions if you've been called about bloody emesis. 
for a patient with upper GI bleeding, determine whether the emesis contains blood. Remember, red food coloring, fruit flavored drinks, vegetables, and some medications can resemble blood. A pH buffered gastrocult test can identify blood in the vomit. You should also look for the color of the blood. In the emesis, bright red blood indicates a fresh bleed, whereas coffee ground emesis indicates older blood. In a patient with upper GI bleeding, it is still important to look at the stool color. You should see if there's melana versus maroon colored stool versus bright red blood or hematochesia. You should also assess the amount of blood, for example, drops of blood versus teaspoon of blood versus tablespoons of blood. Again, always assess the duration of symptoms to see if there's an acute or chronic problem. During the history of present illness, certain symptoms can suggest certain etiologies to the bleeding. For example, emesis prior to hematemesis may suggest a Mallory Weiss tear. Odynophagia or gastroesophageal reflux may suggest esophageal ulcers. Epigastric pain may suggest peptic ulcer. Blood mixed in the stool suggests colitis, and blood streaks on the outside aspect of stool may suggest an anal fissure and suggestive of constipation. Painful stool suggests anal fissures, local proctitis or pancolitis, or ischemic bowel. Painless rectal bleeding is associated with polyps, a Meckel's diverticulum, or a vascular anomaly. Therefore, abdominal pain can be seen in patients with inflammatory bowel disease, colitis of any etiology, or surgical abdomen. Obtaining a focused medical history should include seeing what medications the patient is on or what medications the patient has access to, getting a sense of what medications are in the house, getting a history of NSAID use or aspirin use, or any anticoagulant medications. You should also assess any chronic medical conditions, such as liver disease, renal failure, or previous GI surgery. Again, pertinent family history of GI bleeding or other associated conditions is also useful, such as a family history of inflammatory bowel disease, intestinal polyps, or any bleeding diathesis. If your patient is stable, you can now do a more thorough physical exam to look for possible etiologies. This exam should include an ENT examination. You should examine the nasal pharynx for a source of bleeding, such as a nosebleed or epistaxis or tonsillar bleeding. You should also examine the buccal mucosa. Freckles on the buccal mucosa can suggest puce jager syndrome. If there are evidence of telangiotasias, this can be suggestive of osler reber rendu syndrome. Or aptus mouth ulcers can suggest Crohn's disease. When you examine the skin, you should look for evidence of skin petechiae, ecchymosis, or hemangiomas. This will suggest a coagulopathy or other vascular anomalies. In the setting of the bloody diarrhea, purpura can also suggest henoch Scholine purpura. Spida angioma, caput medosa, palmar erythema, and or jaundice can suggest liver disease or portal hypertension. In your abdominal examination, evaluate bowel sounds for evidence of possible bowel obstruction. Epigastric ab abdominal tenderness may suggest peptic disease. Hepatosplenomegaly and ascites may suggest liver disease. It is important to do a rectal examination in a patient suspected for GI bleeding. You should look for evidence of any perianal disease. It is possible to appreciate polyps on digital rectal examination. You should also look for evidence of hemorrhoids. And at the end of your exam, you should test stool for guaiac. Initial laboratory evaluation of a patient with a suspected GI bleed should include a CBC, chemistry, coagulation panel, ESR and CRP. You should also send a type and screen to the lab. When performing a CBC, remember, initial hemoglobin values may be unreliable. Delay in hemodilution may falsely produce near normal values. Therefore, CBC should be formed serially. Anemia with normal erythrocyte indices suggest acute causes for bleeding. Alternatively, iron deficiency anemia suggests chronic blood loss. Leukopenia or thrombocytopenia may suggest chronic liver disease and portal hypertension or hemolytic uremic syndrome. Abnormal PT or PTT may suggest liver disease or coagulopathy. DIC can be considered in the appropriate clinical setting.
Remember, BUN and creatinine are elevated in acute GI bleeding and can also be seen in hemolytic uremic syndrome and henoch scholine purpura. Elevated ESR or CRP can be seen in inflammatory or infectious colitis. Remember, urgent imaging probably has limited utility in suspected GI bleed. Studies you may consider once the patient has been stabilized include an abdominal x-ray if you suspect small bowel obstruction or foreign body. A bleeding scan can be useful in the patient with significant bleeding that precludes endoscopy or in whom endoscopy was undiagnostic. A bleeding scan is a technetium-99 tagged erythrocyte scan, which detects rapid bleeding at a rate of 0.1 to 0.5 milliliters per minute. This can be performed at 30 minute intervals for up to 24 hours. When a patient has maroon colored stool and you suspect a Meckel's diverticulum, you can perform a Meckel scan. This is a technetium-99 pertechnetate scan that is used to detect gastric mucosa. Angiography can be helpful in detecting vascular anomalies of upper GI bleeding. However, keep in mind this requires bleeding rates of 0.5 to 1 milliliter per minute. Angiography has the added benefit of being therapeutic. This involves injection of coils into bleeding vessels or vascular malformations to occlude it. NG tube lavage is no longer required in patients with suspected upper GI bleeding. Recent studies showed that NG tube lavage did not affect mortality, length of stay, surgery, or need for blood transfusions. Therefore, it is no longer indicated. Barium tests are not useful in the acute setting. Barium can obscure views when performing endoscopy. As we've already mentioned, treatment begins with ensuring patients being made MPO, have stable IV access, obtain blood type, and cross-match red blood cells. Your next steps to initiate include stabilizing the patient with IV fluids and blood products if necessary. Target hemoglobin should be greater or equal to 7 grams per deciliter. Correct any coagulopathy and target an INR less than 2.5. Platelet counts less than 50,000 in the presence of active bleeding may require transfusion. You should consult with your attending and or fellow if your initial lab studies indicate the need for transfusion or if your hemodynamics indicate the need for volume resuscitation. If you suspect an upper GI bleed, you will also treat with intravenous PPI infusion at a rate of one milligram per kilogram bolus with a maximum of 80 milligrams. Then a continuous infusion of 0.1 milligrams per kilogram per hour with a max of eight milligrams per hour. This is the treatment of choice for most common causes of upper, upper GI bleeding, including ulcers, gastritis, and esophagitis. If IV access is limited, you can also consider giving IV doses in a BID manner. PPI therapy neutralizes gastric acid and promotes hemostasis by stabilizing blood clots. This may reduce further bleeding. It also has been proven to decrease the proportion of patients with high-risk stigmata of hemorrhage at the time of endoscopy. Keep in mind, a Cochrane review of PPIs in adults show that PPIs do not reduce bleeding rates or the need for surgery or overall mortality. PPIs have been shown to be efficacious in studies looking in Asian populations, which reduce all-cause mortality and reductions in rebleeding and surgery are greater in Asian studies. This is thought to be secondary to the higher incidence of H. pylori infections in Asian studies. Octreotide treatment has also been used for non-variceal upper GI bleeding. This is a somatostatin analog. It inhibits mesenteric vasodilation induced by glucagon. It indirectly causes splanchnic vasoconstriction and decreases portal blood flow. This reduces gastroduodenal mucosal blood flow and decreases gastric acid secretion by inhibiting gastrin and histamine. It also decreases pepsin secretion and stimulates mucus production in the stomach. Octreotide is given as a one microgram per kilogram bolus with a max of 50 micrograms. 
than one to two micrograms per kilogram per hour with a maximum of 50 micrograms per hour. In a meta-analysis looking at octreotide in the treatment of non-variceal upper GI bleeding, the overall relative risk for further bleeding favored the use of octreotide. However, it is important to note that in the seven investigator blinded trials, the relative risk was less favorable. Therefore, octreotide may reduce the risk of continued bleeding from non-variceal upper GI bleeding and can be considered an adjunctive therapy. In summary, your initial goals for evaluating a GI bleed are to assess if the patient is hemodynamically stable, ensure adequate IV access, send screening labs, including a type in screen, assess for upper versus lower source of GI bleeding based on your history and physical exam, resuscitate with fluids and blood products as needed, consider starting a PPI infusion in conjunction with your attending. That concludes our video on GI bleeding. Thank you for watching.